is in Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 40, and continues where Dina has begun. Think how long it would be to have to wait 700 years for the fulfillment of a promise. Think where that takes us in our history. 700 years ago is back during the time of the Knights in the Middle Ages. Even 500 years ago is the time of the Reformation and the, and the Renaissance, times so remote that it seems impossible that this thing that was promised so long ago could ever happen. And now you get the sense of the joy in the hearts of these two people in the temple when they see Jesus come. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, Yeshua, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after their marriage and then had been a widow for 84 years. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord, la palabra del Señor. Thanks be to God. Gracias a Dios. Well, I hope everyone had a very good Christmas. We are here to celebrate and rejoice over the fact that Christ is born among us, that he has come. Last Thursday on Christmas Eve, Jessica shared with us a little bit about, you know, the anticipation that we have in waiting for that Christ child to come. And yes, thinking about hundreds of years for that the promise had been made. I think of, of how parents are, are preparing for the birth of a, of a child, and especially when, when it's the firstborn child, you know, there's always that, that uh, fear, probably, and anticipating the child, what it's going to be. And, you know, at first you don't even know, you know, is it going to be a boy or a girl? Nowadays people often find that out before the child is born. But you start to dream, you make plans, and think about, you know, what's this child going to be? And I think for Mary and Joseph, it... It was even different because when the, the angel had announced to them that this child was coming, um, with Mary, you know, before she was even married, and, and that it was going to be a special child without a biological father, um, I'm sure they, they must have wondered, you know, what's it going to be? And then all of their dreams and hopes about what the child would be. But then when the child is born, then reality sets in for all sets of parents, and you know, here's this little squirmy little thing that, that needs to be fed and clothed and diapered and, 
you know, protected and watched over and, and such. It becomes the, the center of attention, this little thing. Um, well, in, in the nation of Israel, of course, they had all kinds of rituals and, and things that were required in the law when, when a child was born. And especially if it was a, force, a firstborn male, um, there were even more things that had to be done. For the male child, uh, you know, on the eighth day, he was circumcised. And so Jesus was, was circumcised on that day. Um, then uh, for the firstborn male, as Jesus was, also had to be redeemed because the firstborn males belonged to God. And so they had to be redeemed. And, and though Luke doesn't really say in here that, that they did that, they had to pay like a, a five shekels or something to the temple. Um, but, but Luke says they did everything that was required by, by the law. And so um, it was not a requirement to take him and present him to the temple, but they did that anyway. But the other requirement, the other rule was for the mother, that a woman was ceremonially unclean as when she gave birth. And so for a, a boy child, it would be 40 days and twice that for a girl. So we can know that when they're coming here to present Jesus at the temple and to do, perform the rites of, of purification, that that is for Mary, that she needs to be purified. And she brings the offering of, of the pigeons or the, the doves, um, an indication of their limited means um, for the family. But they come and they bring him and they present him to the temple. And, and yes, that was not something that a w was a requirement. But I, Mary and Joseph, again, knowing the special nature of this child, knowing that he belongs to God in a, in a special way, coming and presenting him there. And even as, as Jessica shared with the children this morning, you know, very similar to what we do when we, when we dedicate children or when we baptize children in here. It's a way of, of saying that this child is a child of the covenant. This child is a child of, of our family. He belongs to the family of God. And so this is what they were saying with, with Jesus as they brought and you know, presented him there as we do. Now we know, you know, when we baptize a child that it isn't the physical right that, that saves that person. The, the child will still have to come to faith in Christ. Same thing with circumcision. You know, the, as Paul often talked about, the being circumcised in the flesh is not what's going to save a person. They have to have faith in, in God and come to, to God. And we know that even with children. But they, they are doing all of the things. This child, this miracle special child that came, comes in the form of an ordinary, normal little baby. And so they're doing the things that were required by the law for him. And they go to, to Jerusalem, a bustling city, and you know the, the temple was always full of activity. Um, and here they come, a husband and wife presenting th with their little infant child, probably didn't look any different than anybody else who was there that day. But Simeon and Anna, there were two prophets that were there waiting and had been watching for God's anointed one to come. Um, Simeon had received that promise that he would not die until the Messiah came. And again, you know, hundreds of years that, this promise, that the children of Israel have been watching and waiting for Messiah to come since the time of Isaiah, but even, even beyond that, back to Moses' day. Um, they're watching and waiting, so centuries going by. And yet uh, Simeon had been told it was going to happen in his lifetime. Well, he's getting pretty old. So you had to be thinking, well, this is going to happen soon. But something special, when they came into the, to the temple area, then Simeon saw him, and the Holy Spirit made it known to Simeon that this is the one. And he rejoiced when he saw this child, and he broke out in praise and, and singing. It's interesting that here in the first two chapters of Isaiah, I mean, sorry, in, in Luke, the first two chapters as we've been reading through, um, these songs of praise as people break out in song. Remember Mary, um, as soon as she knew, you know, the angel had come and told her she was going to have a child, and, and then um, he said, one way you can know this is the truth is by that your cousin Elizabeth or your relative Elizabeth, is, the old woman is also pregnant. And so when she went to visit Elizabeth, and she herself pregnant at, you know, Mary pregnant at that time, hadn't done anything to get herself in that condition. 
And um, seeing Elizabeth, and Elizabeth also much larger with child at that time. And so she burst out in song. She praises God that you use the, the lowly, that you take the humble, and that God raises up those of, of, of low place. Zechariah, who had been promised the, the son in his old age, and at first he didn't believe it. He, he wasn't sure. That he thought, this can't possibly be. But then when, when John is born and the child is named, Zechariah breaks out in song and he gives praise to God for what has happened. He praises God. He's rejoicing over his son and the birth of his son. But even more, he's rejoicing for the one who's not yet born, the one that Mary is carrying, the one that will be a, this, the son of David, the child of David. And so he gives praise. We've seen your salvation is coming. And so today we have Simeon. Who looks, he sees, he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. My eyes have seen your salvation, he says, our invisible God. You know, we believe in a God that we can't see. We're called to have faith in a God that we can't see. And yet for a brief while, for 30-some years, God was visible on earth. He chose to come in a form that we could see. You know, it's like we, we tend to, as human beings, we, we need to have tangible evidence of, of things. You know, we say seeing is believing. Or do you ever say, you know, hear somebody will tell you something that just seems totally implausible, and you say, yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. You know, we think often that the only things that are real in life are the things that we can, that we can experience with at least one of our five senses. We've got to be able to see it or touch it to know that it's real. And during the, the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, that was the case. They said, oh, well, let's do away with all this superstitious nonsense and, you know, things like mystery in the Bible and and all of that, because the only things we know are real are the things that, that are tangible, that we can see, that we can feel, that we can hear or taste. But we know, of course, there's a whole world in this world that we cannot see with our, with our naked eyes anyway, with human eyes. Science a, has also shown us that. You know, we look at this table, and we think this is a hard, solid table, and it's so, Yet we know now, because they've made these powerful microscopes and they can see what this is made of, that you, know, you get down below the molecules and to the atoms and, and to the little subatomic pieces that make up the atom. And someday, I suppose, they'll get down further and see what's, what makes those little subatomic pieces. Maybe they've already done that. I don't know. But it's like, and there's all this activity. So they're not just sitting here. This looks like a solid piece of wood. But it's not. It, there's, there's this, these little atoms are, are moving constantly. And, and not even just, you know, like this. It can go from this point to this point without going here. And, and I mean, it's just amazing what is all going on there. A whole world, a whole world in here and in every cell in our body, a whole world that we can't see, but we know that it's there. I mean, I believe the scientists, when they tell me that stuff, I'll take their word for it. You know, in the same way, there's a world, our spiritual realm, that we can't see with our eyes, but it's just as real as this table. It's just as real. This, you know, the place where God lives, the place where all the angels, the, the demons, the, our ancestors, you know, those that we love who have gone before us, we trust and believe that they are there in that spiritual realm somewhere where we can't see it, but it's just as close. You know, God calls us to have faith we want to believe in the things that we can see. God calls us off, you know, to have faith without seeing. But yet God loves us so much. He wants us to be in relationship with us. He wants to do everything he can so we can come into relationship with him. That he makes it as easy as possible. He comes to us in Jesus Christ. He made himself visible. I remember some years ago having a discussion with a, a person who uh, declared himself to be an atheist. And he said, you know, of course there's no God because if there were a God, all he needs to do if he wants us to believe in him is just appear, just show up. 
And I, he did. He did already. And it didn't, you know, what did it change? I mean, it, yes, it changed everything, but did everybody, does everybody believe? When Mary and Joseph came into Jerusalem that day with their infant Jesus, you know, again, people all over the place. How many people recognized him? You know, this is the most important person ever to be born, the most you know, significant event in human history to that point in time. And most people in Jerusalem were completely oblivious. It doesn't say anything in here about, you know, the rabbi that, that circumcised Jesus, knowing there's anything special about him. It doesn't say that any of the priests, you know, when Jesus was presented, they, you know, it doesn't say they saw anything special. But these prophets, Simeon and Anna, they saw the Lord. They saw that this was God's anointed. This was the Messiah, the one that had been promised. Yes, it was the Holy Spirit who enabled them, the Holy Spirit who, who showed them and was able to speak to their hearts and so they could know that. You know, and God is able, I believe, to reveal himself to anybody, believer or non-believer, um, and, he, and he might do that. But I think most of the time, God comes to those that are seeking him. It says here, Simeon was a devout man. He was righteous and devout. Anna was one who, who said she never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. They were watching. They were waiting. They were anticipating that God would come to them. They had been seeking the Lord. You know, and I think there's so many people that, that miss seeing the Lord. You know, he's come to us in human flesh. Many people who, who missed it when he came as a tiny baby because Many were looking for something else. You know, they, they had an idea of who this one was going to be, the Messiah. Even when Jesus came later as a man, um, you know, they were expecting him to come riding in on, on a horse with sword drawn. Um, and so they missed it. You know, a lot of people miss it because they're just plain not interested. They're not really looking for in spiritual things. They're not paying any attention. You know, God has done so much to, to reveal himself to us. You know, people, you can know just by the, the creation itself. The fact of creation speaks that there has to be a creator. But God did more. He took that step across that chasm that divides us from God. We know that we're separated from God by our sin. We can't save ourselves. So Christ came and crossed that, that wide place to reach to us, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. But he also came to show us who God is so that we can know God. So God says, okay, you've got to have something tangible, you know, with the primitive people making gods out of wood and stone. And God says, no, that's not, that's not me. That's not what I am. But here I am, flesh and blood. You can touch. You can hear. God has to be revealed. God our invisible God made himself visible for a time. But we need eyes of faith to be able to see that. And I know that sounds very suspicious, to, especially to you know, unbelievers. They'll say, oh, well, you're just, you're just making this all up, you know, or whatever. It's all in your own mind. And, and you know, like it, even the, you, we can make a lucky rabbit's foot. We can credit it for everything good that happens if, if we want to go that direction. But yet, no, we know that Jesus is the Lord because of the testimony of all of the, the witnesses who were there. We know because we recognize. Jesus said, don't just believe what I say, but, but look at the works that I've done. If you want to know who I am, we know that Jesus is the Lord because of the things that he did. He did those things that only God could do. He spoke in ways. The things that he said were things that God would say. You know, just like, and Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, they recognize my voice. We know the voice of our God. If we've been seeking him, if we've been listening to him and studying God's word, we know his voice. Just like maybe you, you have a favorite um, musical artist that you like to listen to, and then you're listening to the radio one day and a song comes on, you've never heard it before in your life, but it, but it doesn't go very far before you, rec you perk up your ears and say, ah, I think that's my favorite there, my favorite artist, because you'll, you'll either recognize the instrument, the way it's being played, or the way the music 
flows together in a certain way. You pick up on that because you recognize it. It's a favorite. Just like we know God's voice. We recognize Jesus when he came because we know his voice. Too many people miss it. Too many people don't see. They don't understand. What is it we're expecting today? What do we want to see? You know, Jesus came. The Lord came in a tiny baby. God, our invisible God, came to us in a visible way in a tangible way, one that could be touched and, and seen and heard. It wasn't what most were expecting. What are we expecting? Are we looking for God? Do we see him in the ordinary? Do we think, oh, it's got to come with, with flashing lights and it's got to be bright and brilliant and great? Will we miss the subtle ways? Sometimes God speaks to our hearts. We're, we're asking God for for guidance, Lord, in a decision that we're going to make. God, should I do A or do I go with B over here? And, and we totally miss that there's flashing neon signs over here at, at way A, uh, C, and we miss it because we're focused one direction. You know, we need to be listening for God's voice. He says if we seek him with our whole heart, we will find him. He will reveal himself to us. God wants to come. He wants us to know him. How can we know him? We know him through Jesus Christ. I know there's lots of times in the Old Testament, especially when you're reading, and sometimes it's challenging because God sounds maybe a little different than what we're used to. We can always look, when we need to know, you know what God is like, we look to Jesus, listen to his voice. And let him show us, because he is the manifestation of the love of God. has been revealed to us completely. Look to Jesus and know who God is. He, can, he draws us closer. Let us worship tonight. Worship this morning at the manger, at the cross, as we bow ourselves down and know our God, because he's come to us in flesh. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for coming into our world. Lord, you have gone out of your way to reveal yourself to us. And Lord, now as we are the body of Christ in the world, help us, Lord, you still call us to have eyes of faith, to know you, even though we can't see you. But Lord, help us to help others to be the witness, to be the manifestation of Christ in the world. How glorious it would be, Father, if when people hear the words spoken of the church, that they would hear the voice of God. that when they see the things that we do in the church, that they would say, that's the things God would do. It has not been the case. We have failed in so many ways, Lord. But help us to live up to that, to truly represent our Lord, that we might help people to find their way into right relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.